The following podcast contains stories of violence against women and children. Viewer or listener discretion is advised. Hello and welcome to another Parisia podcast. I'm Shabal Reis, your host, and I've got the privilege of interviewing the president of the Population Research Institute that's now a global movement uh, founded in the United States, but now it's around the world. He's none other than Stephen Mosher. We're going to get to know him, his faith journey, and the work he's doing now. Uh, and let's welcome him now. Hello, Stephen. How are you? I'm, I'm, I'm wonderful down here and uh, down under in Australia. I've been here for a couple of weeks. I've adjusted to the time difference, and I've got to meet a lot of wonderful uh, Australians. Right. If this is not your first trip in Australia, is no, it? No, this is about trip number 12. I, my first 12. trip here came in 1986. I was invited by Senator Brian Herodine, who was a senator from Tasmania, who himself was a good Catholic with 12 children. And he invited me over to testify before the Australian Senate on whether or not Australia's foreign aid agency, AUSAID, should send 7,000 ultrasound machines to China. And I said, Senator Herodine, that's a very bad idea because when those ultrasound machines get to China, they will be used for one purpose and one purpose only, to detect, to detect the sex of the unborn child. And if it's a little boy, the couple will celebrate. If it's a little girl, it'll be followed by a sex selection abortion or by infanticide. So I said, uh, don't send ultrasound machines, send aspirin, send something else if you want to help, but don't send ultrasound machines because every diagnosis of a little girl will be a death sentence for her. So that was my first uh, trip down to Australia back how many years ago? Almost 40 years ago now. Wow, wow. that's um, and 11 trips after. I met you for the first time, it was in 2012, and uh, I actually, I still have it. We recorded a talk on the coming demographic winter. I remember this yeah. on CD and remember the CDs. This was our bread and butter at Parisia. Yeah. It's, it's still true. The, the demographic winter is still coming. Yes. yes. Uh, we're getting closer and closer to it. The temperature is dropping rapidly along with the birth rates. Wow. Well, I can't wait to unpack all this in this hour uh, with you. And you are an expert on China and the whole situation there. And you've been there. And, and before we, we get to that, the, the time when you went to China, um, especially your first visit. Can we talk a little bit about your upbringing? Because you're not a creative Catholic. Um, uh, you were far from any religion. <laughs> um, could you tell us a little bit about, about that and as we try to journey here about your faith journey? Well, I was raised in a, uh, by a non-practicing Protestant uh, mother and a non-practicing Catholic father. And... Um, Really, uh, neither of them ever darkened the door of a church until much later when uh, they followed me into the Catholic Church. That happened a long time later. But um, my only experience, I did have a, a brief uh, experience as a Lutheran growing up. They were building a Lutheran church about a mile from my house. And the first thing they did was they erected a giant cross in the sky, which is what you should do if you're building a Christian church. And I was drawn to the cross at the age of 12. And so for several years, I was you know, in the Lutheran youth group. I was a Lutheran altar server in the days when the Lutherans still had altar servers. And then I went to college and I promptly forgot everything I had learned. I became convinced that, um, that God didn't exist or if he existed, he wasn't relevant to my existence. And, uh, and uh, that's my state of mind when I was at Stanford University in 1976. I had served for eight years in the U.S. Navy in the Far East, became interested in China, and in 1976 went to Stanford to get a Ph.D. in anthropology, really Sinology, studying China first and foremost. Okay. And uh, I had no particular religious belief system. I mean, I was a committed secular humanist. I was a moral relativist. I was a situational ethicist. Everything was shades of gray. There was no absolute truth. There was no absolute evil. We just had to manage as best we can in a world that was essentially meaningless. That was my worldview at the time. Wow. So, so did that happen? So that faith as a teenager going to church very quickly, college, it didn't take long at all. <laughs> going to college, uh, uh, that what you did as a teenager 
was forgotten. It did not. Quickly. It did not carry over, and of course, okay. sadly, that's a story that uh, could be repeated by millions, mm -hmm. uh, even tens of millions of people. Yeah. Um, our universities in the United States, our colleges and universities, with some honorable exceptions, like Franciscan University of Steubenville or Ave Maria University yes. uh, in Florida, where I live, Ave Maria, Florida, uh, they are secularizing institutions. Whatever belief system students come in with, they generally leave with the, you know, mm. a, a, well, almost a Marxist view of the world that we might as well eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. There is no ultimate meaning to anything. And uh, that that's, uh, has caused a lot of people, and including me, to lose their faith. Yeah, wow. That's, you're, as you're correct, it's the fastest growing body of people today. Uh, it's the fastest growing religion, as they say, the nothings or the nuns. Yeah. Uh, Australia is about 30% at the moment and yeah. from the last census. So Christianity is dropping and uh, the nuns <laughs> are growing. So it's yeah. interesting. This is becoming true around the world. And th I think the United States would be very, very similar, if not maybe. It's, it's a dramatic decline in religious faith in, in my country. Uh, 25 years ago, uh, you would do public opinion surveys, and they would show that 92 to 93 percent of the American people believed in God. Wow. And more than half, more than half, were in church every Sunday, Catholic, Protestant, practicing. evangelical. And more than half were practicing. Mm -hmm. uh, those numbers have fallen uh, considerably over the last 25 years. I think uh, in large part because of the the fact that the social glue that is holding society together is being dissolved by electronic means of communication. Kids are spending more and more time on cell phones and computers and less and less time interacting with others and mm -hmm. interacting with nature. I mean, one way to convince yourself of the existence of God yes. is just to go out and watch the sunrise yes, or, exactly. or watch a sunset. Such beauty does not arise accidentally. Yeah, very well said. Now you are an expert in China. Uh, so what, what, what led from your PhD? You, you were sent, were you sent to China or you requested to go on a, you on a mission? Uh, that first, could we go to there, was it 1976 you were saying, your trip to China? Um, so I was, I, I went to Stanford uh, University on a National Science Found, Foundation okay. Fellowship in 1976. And in 1979, uh, in, um, early on in that year, the President of the United States, Jimmy Carter, announced that we were normalizing relations with the People's Republic of China. Uh, no American uh, scientist, social scientist, had been on the ground in China since 1949. So wow. uh, 30 years behind the bamboo curtain, we really didn't know what life was like under you know, three decades of communism. Uh, I was selected by the National Science Foundation and by something called the Committee on Scholarly Communication with the People's Republic of China and by the National Security Council to be the first American social scientist on the ground in China. And I was very young, uh, but I had the language, you see, because I'd spent some time in Hong Kong. I can speak, uh, read and write Mandarin and Cantonese. And so I proposed to go to the Pearl River Delta, about 80 miles up the uh, Pearl River from Hong Kong, and do a year-long study of a Chinese commune. And uh, somewhat to my surprise, I was picked as the only social scientist in the first wave of scholars from the United States to go to China. Now there were 49 others, but they were all studying physics, nuclear physics, engineering, mm -hmm. chemistry, hard sciences, or they were in the humanities. I was the only one who proposed actually going and living and working among uh, ordinary Chinese people. And wouldn't you know it, the Chinese Communist Party wanted nothing to do with my research. They said, no, we don't want an inquisitive social scientist who can speak, read, and write Chinese wandering about the countryside talking to ordinary people. <laughs> um, and it was only after President Jimmy Carter brought up the matter of my research with Deng Xiaoping, who was China's senior leader, that Deng Xiaoping, who was desperate Remember, this is the late 1970s, desperate to modernize China, desperate to get his hands on American science and technology, Western science and technology, mm -hmm. and capital and access to our markets. Deng Xiaoping said to President Carter, oh, it won't be a problem. It won't be a problem. So I had permission from Deng Xiaoping, the paramount leader of China, to do my research. And after that, all doors were open to me. 
I could go uh, where I wanted to go. I could talk to whom I wanted to talk to. And uh, I could do it without minders. You know, originally they had sent two, um, two uh, people, officials from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to shadow me, to sit in on interviews. And you can understand that if, 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 uh, if I'm sitting here talking to you and you're a, a local official in a village and there's a, an official from Beijing sitting in the conversation, you're going to be very careful in what you say. Because this is a one-party dictatorship, and you don't want to say anything against the party line that might be reported. So uh, I had to get rid of those guys. I did, by the simple expedient of not paying them. They expected me to pay them for their <laughs> translation services. I said, I don't you know, need your help with translation. Thank you very much. And so they left, and so I was on my own in the village. One of the pivotal moments in, in, uh, in, in my experience there, and there were many, um, the first week I was there, a local official came over and said to me, uh, things are wonderful now. Uh, we eat better, we live better, the educational system is better, the medical system is better, everything is sweetness and light. A year later, that same official came back to see me. We'd become friends in the meantime. Mm. He said, I just want you to know, uh, Mao Sidi, that's my Chinese name. Mao Sidi. He said, I just want you to know, Mr. Mao, that um, everything I told you on that first visit was a lie. I was ordered to come. So wow. there you have sort of the bookends of yes. my stay in China. The so original it was about a year, to a year the, in a total. Hmm? It was a year in total. That, that was that, a year in total yeah, I was okay. in China. So you see in the beginning they were trying to convince me that uh, they had done marvelous things to improve the lives of ordinary people in China. By the end they were admitting to me that Things had been pretty horrific. That mm. A lot of people have been killed. A lot of people have been tortured to death. Uh, the Great Leap Forward, massive deaths in the famine that followed, the Cultural Revolution, millions of people killed, the persecution of various groups for speaking out against the government, and of course, and of course the one-child policy, yeah. which began when I was in China, where women were arrested for the crime of being pregnant without permission. Wow. Wow. Did, in your research uh, about, did you, because you, you had, did you have how much ID, what did you, they didn't want you to come initially, so what did they know you knew already? <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, well. So I'm wondering in your research, what was that like? And then when you finally got there, um, you were surprised uh, or was it reaffirming what you already knew? Well, no, I, 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 I had been taught at Stanford University by, by senior sinologists mm -hmm. that, that, that life had gotten better. Uh, most of the people um, in the professorate at um, Stanford University uh, are not people of faith, okay, yeah. uh, are people who uh, are on the left side of the political spectrum. And so they communicated to me a very favorable view of the communist Chinese revolution. Uh, revolution. Um, and it took, I must say, um, I'm kind of ashamed to admit it, but it took many, many months for my friends in China, in the people's commune I was living in, to convince me that it wasn't so, that things in many respects were worse in 1979 and 1980 than they had been before the communists arrived in 1949. Now that's an astonishing statement. Yes. And uh, the Chinese Communist Party was not happy when I began saying things like that. That's why I think they wanted to keep me out of China to begin with, keep me at least out of the countryside, um, or at least keep me under watch so I, I wouldn't be learning these things about real life in China from ordinary people. Um, the people felt exploited by the Chinese Communist Party. Um, one told me that, uh, you know, before the revolution, we could raise crops, we could raise fish in our fish ponds, we could raise uh, silk, raise silkworms and make silk, and then sell it for a high price. He said, now we have to sell everything to the government at very low prices. And then the government turns around and sells it overseas and makes a handsome profit. Mm -hmm they referred to the Chinese Communist Party as the big landlord. Yeah, and remember that. in the Chinese context, uh, landlord was a term of, not a term of praise. 
the landlords were attacked by the Chinese Communist Party as exploiting the peasantry. And here you had the peasants themselves now calling the Chinese Communist Party the big landlord as if it was and, and is the greatest exploiter of them of all time, which wow. it is. So lots of scales begin to fall mm. away from my eyes. But um, the pivotal moment in my conversion when I came when I, was, um, when I was an eyewitness to the one child policy. Because on um, March 8th of 1980, a local official came down uh, to see me uh, waving a Communist Party director, directive. And he said, Mr. Mao, I, I thought you'd like to see this directive, which has just come down from the Communist Party committee in charge of the province. Well, I'd like to see any directive I could get my hands yes. on. But this was an astonishing document because it said the population of Guangdong province, which is the province next door to Hong Kong, right? The southernmost okay. province, Canton province, we used to call it. This directive said the population of Canton province is growing too rapidly and we must cap the population growth at 1% in the year 1980. We're in 1980. And I said, well, that's very clear, but how in the world are you going to cap the population growth at, at, at 1%? I said, all of the babies, this is March of 1980, all the babies who are going to be born in 1980 have already been conceived. It takes nine months from yes. conception to natural birth. He said, oh, it's very simple. We're going to do a house-to-house -house survey of the village. We're going to determine who is pregnant without permission, who's pregnant with a second child or a third child, or if they're a young woman of 18 or 19, the new marriage age is 20, 22, they can't get pregnant, even though they're already married, and we will tell them they must go in for abortions. That's exactly what he did. And then they ordered those young women to go to a meeting at which, at which he said, none of you has any choice. You must get an abortion, whether you want one or not. And uh, there were 18 holdouts in my village who were arrested for the crime of being pregnant. Arrested. Taken to a local lockup, taken to a local detention center. And there they were subjected to morning to night study sessions by senior party officials. Again, telling them, none of you has any choice. You will get an abortion, whether you want one or not. You can't sit here and eat the government's rice and, and, and sleep in the government's detention center until you give birth. We won't allow you to keep your children. You will go home alone. That was a threat of what? That was a threat not just a forced abortion. Mm -hmm. That was the threat of infanticide. That threat was actually carried out. So um, I was there. Local officials were not happy I was there. But remember, I had permission from Paramount leader Deng Xiaoping. Yes. So they couldn't kick me out. Mm. So I was an eyewitness to these crimes against humanity. What crimes? Well, forced abortion, forced abortion in the third trimester pregnancy, the killing of babies at birth by lethal injection. In that case, in the case of women brought in in labor, uh, the doctors were under orders not to allow the children to live, and so they would wait until the baby's head was crowning, right? In a normal birth, the baby's head emerges yes. first. They would then give a, a lethal injection of formaldehyde or alcohol into the soft spot of the child's skull, causing death within minutes. So forced abortion, forced sterilization as well. These women were not only aborted, they were then sterilized so they wouldn't come back and get pregnant with an illegal child a second time. Um, and, and of course, part of the one child policy has always been um, eugenics. The governing policy was few children, which meant one for the most part, uh, late childbirth, which meant that you couldn't have children until you reach the official age of marriage, which was 22 or 23 for women, and 25 to 27 for men. And if you conceived a child before then, that was an illegal child. Wow. And the third part was quality births. And so any handicapped ch child was not allowed to live. If there were doctors present, they simply would kill the child. So few births, late births, quality births. Went on from 1980 when I was there until 2016, 
when the one-child policy finally ended. We had a senior Communist Party official come and visit us in Washington, D.C. in 2012. He had, he had been the Minister of Health mm -hmm. of the People's Republic of China. And he was bragging to us that uh, over the course of the three and a half decades of the one-child policy that China had eliminated 400 million people from its population. 400 million people. And he went on to say, we've contributed to the solution to global warming by eliminating 400 million people from our population. And he expected us to applaud. Well, the people he was meeting with uh, didn't applaud for the most part. They included uh, some pro-life friends of mine who are in Congress. Uh, they were horrified. When you think about the, the number uh, is just uh, it boggles the imagination. 400 million of anything mm -hmm. is a huge number. Australia's uh, not even 27 million. 20, yeah. So, you know, many times the population of Australia has been eliminated in China by forced abortion, by infanticide uh, over the last 40 some years. And of course, they've made themselves poorer because they've eliminated 400 million of the most hardworking, productive, enterprising people the planet has ever seen thinking somehow they'd be better off in the process, ran on until 2016. In 2016, what happened? Uh, well, first of all, the leaders of the Chinese Communist Party don't like to admit ever that they're wrong. Hmm. Now, it's true, politicians have a tough time apologizing even in democracies, right? Yes. But uh, Communist Party leaders uh, take that to a, a higher level. Um, they refused to admit, admit for decades, uh, they refused to admit for decades that uh, they had made a grievous error. But they carried on the policy long after, it never made any sense, but long after it made any sense in economic terms. In 2016, what happened was uh, the leader of China, the, the current leader, Xi Jinping, woke up to the fact that China had a labor shortage of 4.1 million workers. How do you create a labor shortage in the most populous country on the planet? Well, killing off half of the last two generations will pretty much put you in a place where you don't have enough workers, young workers. Wow. And so he decided that he was going to have to back away from the one-child policy, and so he magnanimously declared that China was going to move to a two-child policy. They announced it, and then they sat back and they waited for a baby boom. That never happened. Why didn't it happen? Well, they'd spent the last 36 years telling young people in China that babies were burdens and not blessings, that the fewer children you had, the better off the country would be, the better off they would be. And their propaganda wow. had, had, had been very effective. Uh, nobody in China wanted to have a large family. There was a little boomlet in 2017, and by 2018, the numbers had dropped back to the second lowest fertility rate in the world. China now has the second lowest birth rate of any country in the world. You want to guess what number one is? Uh, is it a European country? No, or a, a no number one is tiny Singapore. Oh, wow. You know, mm. two and a half million people living on 22 square miles of land, all in high-rise apartment mm -hmm. buildings. Not a very uh, conducive environment to raising a large family, right? You're on the 24th floor of yes. a 30-story building. Um, so little, tiny Singapore has a, a lo slightly lower birth rate than China. China has the second lowest birth rate in the world. So what did they do in 2021? In June, they announced that they were going to a three-child policy. Had no effect. Chinese young people yawned. In fact, Chinese young women were saying, how can the Communist Party expect us to have three children? They said, because of the one-child policy, we're already caring for our aged parents. Yes. We're already caring for, in many cases, two or three of our grandparents wow. who are still alive. So how can we possibly have more than one child? If we went on to have two or three, it would simply be unsustainable. We ourselves would be caring for five or six people all by ourselves. And so uh, the, the three-child policy hasn't had its desired effect. 
Sichuan province, which is China's most populous province, has just announced that it's removing all restrictions on childbearing. You're now free to have four or five or six. <laughs> Nobody in China wants children. Very, very few, except some Catholics do. Interesting. We can talk about that, but most uh, Chinese young people don't want to get married, much less get married and have children. Uh, the propaganda has worked all too well. Starting and from 1980. And from 1980 to, 2020, we're now in 2023, yes. you see. This is two generations of families where all of the branches of the family tree have been shorn away. You think about it, a father and a mother have one child. That child has no siblings, no brothers, no sisters. Then their only child marries another only child and they have one child. Their child has no cousins, has no aunts and uncles. There's only the trunk of the family tree. That child has a parent, a father and a mother, and uh, two sets yeah. of grandparents. That's the extent of the family. So in one of the most traditionally family-minded cultures of the world, they have literally destroyed the family. My goodness. And so you've got two generations of only children who haven't learned to share, haven't learned to, uh, not very well socialized, uh, because they were only children. So um, China has created for itself a demographic trap, and I don't think there's any way out of it. Uh, if you look at the number of young women in China, now, here's another point. Chinese couples who were only allowed one child disproportionately wanted their only children to be girls, uh, to not to be girls, to be boys. And so what did they do? They eliminated millions upon millions of unborn baby girls by sex selection abortion mm -hmm. and by female infanticide. And so now you've got an absolute shortage of young women. You've got 30 million more young men than women. Those young men will never find brides. Their brides were killed a long time ago in utero or right after birth. So you've got so few young women in China that um, every young woman in China would have to marry at 21 and have at least three children to offset the current population decline. Yeah. And there's no set of incentives that I can see that will result in that happening. You tell young women that they need to get married at 21 and have three children, they laugh at you. Why? Because they're caring for parents and, and grandparents. Yeah. So, but I'm, I'm very afraid, Charbel, that at the end of the day, the Chinese Communist Party will do in reverse what it did with the one-child policy. Instead of forced abortion, we'll have forced pregnancy. Instead of forced sterilization, we'll have forced insemination. And you think, no government would do that. That would be horrific. Well, it's no more horrific on, on the murderous scale that they use than forcing women who are nine months pregnant to, to be aborted. Mm -hmm. It's no more horrific than killing babies at birth. Would Xi Jinping have any moral compunctions about forcing women to bear children? I can't think of any. Uh, if he thought it would not. be good, you know, if he, he's thinned the herd to the point where there are too few people to achieve the goals he has for China of world domination. He needs now to breed more Chinese. Would he hesitate to use any means at his disposal? Forced pregnancy, cloning, growing mm -hmm. babies in test tubes? I don't think so. Wow. Remember the statement of uh, Vladimir Ilyich Lenin, whatever advances the revolution is ethical. That's how the Marxists think. Whatever enhances my power, Xi Jinping will say to himself, and the power of the Chinese Communist Party and the goals of the party is ethical. What, uh, when you were there um, and you, you saw this back in 1980, the impact that had you actually, did you uh, witness, um, I guess, the process for you to describe or you, uh, earlier? Um, you've witnessed the abortions yourself? With your, you've seen them? Or 
that would have, I mean, uh, what did uh, that do I'll, to you I'll as tell a human? You, I'll <laughs> tell you exactly what happened. The women would be brought into the abortion clinic. Now this was a normal medical clinic which had been converted for the purposes of the one child policy into an abortuary, okay? Woe to those who became ill with some other sickness during this period of time because they were doing nothing in this clinic except assembly line abortions and assembly line sterilizations, okay? The young women would be brought in. The first thing that would happen would be that they would be given an injection of a poison into the womb. Now these young women were five, seven, nine months pregnant. The injection was intended to kill their unborn child within 48 hours. And so once the injection had taken place, something that we might call the death watch began. These young women were in bed, uh, feeling their babies move, thinking, my baby's dying, my baby's been given an injection of poison. This might be the last time that my baby kicks. It was a horrible time. They were crying, they were red-eyed. I was, I was there in them in these, in, during the death watch. And then, after two days, they would be brought in for an abortion. Now, because they were so far along, they, they wouldn't do uh, the abortion in the normal manner. They were doing something that, that had been unknown up to that point. They were doing cesarean section abortions. They were doing cesarean sections, opening up mm. uh, the women, like 10 cans, and then removing the now dead, or in some cases dying babies. Uh, I was in the operating room when they were doing these procedures. Procedures, that makes it sound like a medical yeah, procedure. No. These, these, these barbarous acts, these murderous acts, uh, and um, of course the women were then taken immediately over and sterilized subsequently so as I said they wouldn't get pregnant a second time um, against their will this is against uh, their will yeah. yeah they were not there voluntarily mm. yeah so my reaction I suddenly realized that uh, my entire worldview was mistaken. You see, I thought everything was shades of gray, right? I thought <laughs> morals were relative and that ethics were situational. And I had colleagues back at Stanford saying, well, China does have a population problem. You know, after all, they, 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 they need to reduce their numbers, otherwise, you know, the, the entire country might collapse. So, um, but I was, I, was, I was witnessing acts that uh, were unjustifiable. For me, it was as if the pit of hell had opened up before me. Yeah. I saw these children killed, and they were um, innocent victims who had been given a death sentence for no reason at all. You know, it was a slaughter of the inno innocents on a scale, unimaginable scale. And um, I thought to myself, this is, this is evil. I mean, it, says, it sounds yeah. obvious to say it, right? This yes, is the obvious right. evil. Everyone listening knows it's evil. Yes. They have, they, because they're pro-life, they're Catholic, and they understand that abortion is an evil act. You see, I hadn't understood what an abortion was up to that point. I'd considered it to be a woman's problem. It wasn't an mm -hmm. issue I thought about very much. Very convenient position for a young man to take, I must say. And here I was confronted with it. And it was clear that it was the killing of an innocent human being who had done nothing whatsoever to deserve the death sentence. It was the death of a tiny son of Adam, a tiny daughter of Eve. And um, an absolutely evil act. So there went my shades of gray, right? They're gone. This is black, this is evil. There's no way to justify this. Well, reacting to evil, you can, you can have, I think, only one of two reactions. You can either say, okay, if such a great, great evil exists, then nothing makes any sense. I might as well eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow I die, the universe is mad. 
Or you can say, if such a great evil can exist, there must be a counterbalancing good. There must be a countervailing good to counterbalance the evil. Yes. Otherwise, the universe is mad. <laughs> I didn't want to live in an insane asylum. And so I began to seek the good. And if you seek, God is the source of all goodness, right? Yes. So if you seek the good, you'll be drawn inexorably to God. And uh, that's the journey that, that I began to make at that point in time. So I call my conversion story, which was published by Ignatius Press some years ago, Finding God in China. Okay. Because we'll I did find God that. in China. At least took the first steps, tottering steps towards God in that operating room, witnessing the deaths of, uh, the deaths of innocents. Wow. You came back to the States uh, 1980, late 1980 or 81? Was, uh, and then... You have to report. Uh, well, what you I'm, I'm a very slow learner That's okay. when it comes to some very important things. So it took me a while to get back. So, um, just wanting to get a bit of a timeline here now. So it's now early, early 80s. Uh, you've seen this. You've had to now report back to the president or is this back for the American government? Uh, this was a research trip, right? So what was the... It was a research trip and I began to... Um, to uh, write a book about it, yeah. and uh, China, the Chinese Communist Party, began to complain about my research. What were their grounds? What were you their doing? Their grounds that was... were that I had not been doing academic research at all. They accused me of spying. They accused me of writing articles to attack China. Well, I was writing articles to truthfully report on what I had seen in China. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, my reports did not put the Chinese Communist Party in a very flattering light. And so they began to attack me as a spy. Now, they said to the US government, when I began to write about what I had seen in the operating room in the one child policy, they said to the U.S. government that unless, um, and to Stanford University, that unless you punish Stephen Mosher for writing these reports to attack China, we're going to terminate the entire scholarly exchange program with the United States. And they said to Stanford that unless you punish Stephen Mosher severely, we're going to abrogate, we're going to terminate the agreement that we have with Stanford University, the exchange wow. agreement with Stanford University. So I went back to Stanford um, and met with my colleagues, whom I expected, I think, to be supportive. Well, they weren't. One said to me that he found forced abortions in the third trimester of pregnancy to be abhorrent. So far, so good. Mm -hmm. But he said it was no worse than the Reagan administration denying federal funding to poor women for abortions. At which point, he lost all credibility in my view. Because this is moral equivalence with a, with a vengeance. Mm -hmm. You're trying to compare the forced abortion of a woman and the killing of a nearly full-term baby with the principled refusal of a pro-life president to take tax money from pro-life Americans to fund abortions? Exactly. Are you mad? I mean, this makes no <laughs> sense. So, so he uh, resigned, uh, refused to read my dissertation. I had another colleague who said, uh, he was actually more honest. He said, well, I'm, I'm personally opposed to um, um, forced abortion. He said, but I, I want to go to China next year, and if I'm associated mm -hmm. with you, I won't be able to go. So wow. we're done. He was honest. He was putting his own career ahead of the truth. And uh, so that's the way it went. I got very little support at Stanford. Uh, but I did get support from uh, a, a very surprising source. It wasn't long after uh, that, that I got a call from a Catholic priest by the name of Father Paul Marx. Mm -hmm. Now, I'd never spoken to a Catholic priest before. So you can understand when 
he introduced himself as Father Paul Marx, I was a little nervous. <laughs> he called to invite me to speak at a conference. Now, normally, at Stanford mm -hmm. University, we wouldn't have had anything to do with pro-lifers. I mean, they're just sort of, yeah, the radical, you know, yes. fetus-loving fanatics. You just don't want anything to do with them. But no one else was listening. My colleagues had abandoned me. I had actually gone to see the head of the National Organization of Women because they're a leading feminist group, right? Yeah. They're pro-choice, right? Mm -hmm. So I thought, in my naivete, that the National Organization of Women is going to absolutely join with me in condemning China's one-child policy because women in China are being denied a choice. They're being forced yeah. to have abortions. They're being forcibly sterilized. Surely yes. the National Organization of Women would, 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 would uh, oppose that. So I laid out my evidence, and I have pictures of what I have just described to you. And uh, I got all done, and the head of the National Organization of Women looked at me and said, again, I'm personally opposed to forced abortion, but after all, she said, China does have a population problem. See you later. Wow. They weren't willing to say or do anything. And then I found out, I learned, they were all hypocrites. Yes, they claim to be in favor of choice. They're not in favor of choice. The only choice the radical feminists want is, is a choice that leads to the death of, of unborn children. They're not pro-choice at all. They're pro-abortion, although they don't like to admit that. They're pro-human sacrifice. They're pro the killing of innocents. Wow. I mean, when you put it like that and, and the graphic imagery that, that you can think of the way you described, many people don't want to even talk about this. They, they don't like to see images and they're turned off by, by images of abortion, thinking that the people showing the images of abortion are the, are the troublemakers trying to stir up problems and, 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 and push some propaganda. But the reality is this is the, the, what's going on millions of babies around the world, not just China now, but this has been a, a problem for decades and decades. Um, and if we can't talk about the evils of abortion, what can we talk about? But wow, we're just talking about China here. How long was it when you went back to the States, you've now your close friends, your colleagues, and now you have this priest that wants to talk to you. What did that- He, wa he wanted to talk to me, you see, and, and no one else was listening. Mm. So I thought, well, I might as well go. Yeah. And speak to these pro-lifers. I was a little nervous. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I found myself in the middle of a couple thousand of the most warm and kind and loving and friendly people that I had ever encountered. Wow. What year is this? So probably? very different. Uh, 1984. 84. Okay. Yeah. So very, very different than the, uh, the mega minds at Stanford University, you know, who... Um, in many cases, simply because they scored well on standardized tests, think that they're somehow superior to the, to the rest of humanity. They're not. Morally, of course, they have long since rejected God, for, in, in most cases because they think of themselves as kind of minor godlike beings. Yeah. Uh, so I found myself in the middle of uh, a crowd of pro-lifers, and they were, they were loving and kind and, and, uh, and, and engaged in a struggle for which they would receive no possible gain in this world. They were fighting on behalf of the unborn, giving voice to the voiceless. And uh, I was very moved by their struggle because I realized that I was, I was one of them and I wanted to be like them. Wow. I wanted to possess the joy and the uh, uh, the love that they obviously possessed for their fellow human beings, including for the unborn. Father Marx hadn't made me the best offer in the world. He, we talked about uh, speaking at his conference, and I agreed to come, and he said, uh, you know, I can't afford to pay you, but you can bring some of your books, and maybe you'll sell a few. <laughs> it wasn't the best offer I'd ever gotten, but you had the only one on the table. 1984? 1984, yeah. You had a book by then? I had uh, a book called Broken Earth, Okay. The Rural Chinese, uh, in which I wrote about my, my year in, um, in the Chinese commune. Okay. 
And uh, it uh, made, made quite a splash across the United States because it was, it was the first insider's view of life in China that we had wow. uh, at the time in the, United, in, the, in the U.S. So, yeah. So, and then uh, a year later, I went to the uh, National Right to Life Committee's annual meeting. And the president of Na National Right to Life, uh, Jack Wilkie, uh, had invited me to speak at a breakout session, you know. So I went thinking I'll be speaking to 100 people or 200 people. And at the morning opening session, Jack stood up and announced that the keynote speaker, Senator Orrin Hatch, had been delayed on the floor of the U.S. Senate. Wasn't going to be able to join us. He said, but we have a wonderful speaker here who's just come back from Asia. And I'm sitting in the front row thinking, well, who's this wonderful speaker who's just come back from Asia? And in fact, he's just come back from China. Now I'm looking around nervously. <laughs> he said, I'd like Stephen Mosier to come up and talk to us. So Just like that. <laughs> uh, just like that. I got to speak to 5,000 people, uh, wonderful pro-lifers as well, on what was going on in China. And I found uh, a new home. Mm -hmm. It wasn't tenure at Stanford University, but it was a home among um, mostly Catholic. Yeah. Um, you know, the pro-life movement in the U.S. historically has been led by Catholics. We have a lot of evangelical Christians as well, but uh, there wouldn't be a pro-life movement in the U.S. I think without uh, without the Catholic without the Catholic influence. Yeah. So that played a role in my conversion as well. Wow. Uh, this is, uh, we're still in 84, or we've moved on now, we're in 80, 80, 85, 85. And at, at the same time, uh, I met uh, the woman who became my wife. We were actually, the first mass I ever went to was, uh, was in a place called San Luis Obispo, along the coast of California. Now, there was a Franciscan missionary by the name of Father Junipero Serra, who set up a series of missions along the California coast. That's why all the California cities are named after saints, right? You've yes. got San Diego, St. James, you've got uh, um, San Buenaventura, you've got San, um, Santa Barbara, San Jose, San Francisco, yes. <laughs> you know. Catholic and of saints. course, Los Angeles, the Ciudad de los, the City of the Angels. All these missions, he founded 20, 26 missions in all. So we were visiting San Luis Obispo, which was St. Louis the Bishop, um, and, and there was a Spanish mission not far from where we were when the church bells rang out at noon. And my then girlfriend, Vera Cruz, grabbed me by the hand and said, let's go to mass. And she wouldn't take no for an answer. I didn't protest, I just went in with her. That was the first Catholic mass I'd ever been to. And I instantly felt uh, at home. I felt oh. like I had, I had come home. I felt a sense of welcome. I enjoyed the service and uh, have rarely missed Mass since. But, you know, she didn't ask me if I wanted to go to Mass. She just took me by the hand and took me in. And I remember uh, it very well because it was my first Mass, but also because standing outside of the door of the church was a witch. Really? There, there was a woman screaming obscenities at all of us who were going into the church. Curses and everything. Obviously long black hair and anyway. Uh, well. Clearly, I, I, I don't know whether she was possessed or not, but, but whatever demon was, was activating her was very upset that people were going into the Catholic Church for Mass. I can imagine. <laughs> Now, uh, Vera, so Vera Cruz, you just said, uh, also a name. Her name, her That's maiden a, name. You see, this, is a, that. That's this is a great name for a Catholic. Her maiden yeah. name was Vera Cruz, right. which means true cross. True cross. true cross. Wow. So I like to joke, and she's learned to laugh yeah. at the joke that she's my true cross. <laughs> so, in go. fact, <laughs> I say when she married me, it was a step down because she went from being the true cross to being merely the true Mosier, but uh, no. She was a great example of, uh, wow. of uh, living the faith. When did you get married? What year was that? Yeah, uh, the, the year after that. Okay, yeah. fantastic. So. Were you, so did you join the form, you weren't Catholic still? 
Were you Catholic? I then? was. I was. I had not yet been to RCIA because we were moving around. You see, I was going from job to job. I didn't have tenure at Stanford University. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I was back in Washington D.C. for a year at the Heritage Foundation, and then back with a an institute called the Claremont Institute in Southern California, but going back and forth. What were that, what types of jobs are they? What, just to give us a... Uh, I, was, I was directing an Asian Studies Center okay. at the Claremont Institute. I was a resident scholar at the Heritage Foundation writing okay. another book. Still exists. So they were jobs from, in, yeah. in, in sort of uh, in think tanks. Yes. So, um, so it wasn't until uh, I got back from my Heritage Foundation stint in 1989 that I was able to sign up for the full year course of the RCIA, the Roman Catholic Rite of Adult Initiation. Yes. Right. Initiation for adults. And uh, it, was, it was in the San Bernardino Diocese. And I must say it was something of a disappointment because the San Bernardino Diocese is a suffragan diocese of the uh, Archdiocese of Los Angeles. And at the time, the Cardinal Archbishop of Los Angeles was Cardinal Roger Mahoney. Oh, yes. who was not known for his orthodoxy. defense of orthodoxy, shall mm. we say. Being had a lot as, of clashes with... Being uh, as generous as we can in our Mother appraisal. Angelica. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, there, were, there mm. was... Uh, yeah. And, uh, and Father Marx, of course, who brought me in and helped to bring me into the Catholic Church, played a role in that as well, because I had only been to a couple uh, RCIA sessions when... I began to suspect that we weren't being taught the meat and potatoes of the faith. There were about a dozen seekers in the class, and we were being led by a, a fellow who, whose heart was in the right place, but who had been told that the new model of the church was not hierarchical, and that bishops and cardinals and the pope really didn't matter because we were all fundamentally equal. And so he would have us, well, metaphorically speaking, sit around the campfire singing Kumbaya. Um, and and uh, wow. so I, I called up Father Marx and, and oh, I had been given a, um, a, uh, a catechism called The Way, which had been written by a Jesuit that couldn't bring itself to mention abortion, contraception, sterilization could barely bring itself to mention the Ten Commandments. <laughs> uh, it was all about social justice. And, and Interesting. I, I have no problem with serving the poor and feeding the hungry and clothing the naked and giving drink to the thirsty. Um, but that's not the sum total of the faith. So I called Father Marx. I said, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to go through with this, Father, because I feel like I'm in sitting in, uh, I've, been, I've been, uh, been confined to some sort of leftist indoctrination camp here. Uh, if I wanted to be a, a social worker, I'd, I'd go back to college and get a degree in social work. <laughs> I said, surely there's more to the faith than this. He said, don't do anything hasty. I'll send you a catechism. <laughs> so he sent me a catechism by Father John Hardin, oh, yes. Catechism of the Catholic Church, which I think prior to the universal catechism of St. Pope John Paul II is the, was the best catechism we had. And I read that. Wow. And uh, after that, I'm afraid I was, well, I was never obnoxious in, in the RCIA class, but I sort of supplemented the lessons as best I could with the truth about the Catholic faith and uh, sort of wound up team teaching it. But I entered the church on a beautiful spring day um, in April of 1991. Easter Vigil? Was that an Easter Vigil time? That was at, at, on Easter, Easter yes. Yeah. yes. But of course, now God never sends great graces without sending great crosses. And the name of this cross was Andrew Christian Mosier. My son, who was born a week later, and who promptly decided um, not to breathe. His lungs were immature. Mm -hmm. And they had to put him on a ventilator and later on a kind of heart-lung machine. And uh, he was near death. He was in the NICU, Neonatal Intensive Care Unit, for a month. Um, 
And that was a, a pivotal time in my faith life because that's when my wife and I began for the first time praying together. We were joined together in prayer by our desire to ask God's help and healing uh, for our infant son who was on the, uh, uh, on the edge of dying. So, um, and, and I would say that each of my children has had a lesson for me, yes. uh, has helped me along uh, the road to uh, learning to deepen my Catholic faith. Um, you know, well, children come into the world yes. naked and you clothe them. They come into the world hungry and you feed them. They come yes. into the world thirsty and you give them drink. Most of us, those of us who aren't called to the priesthood, to the religious life, uh, do the uh, corporal and, and uh, the spiritual works of mercy, often for our own children. That's I've done point. all the corporal and spiritual works of mercy for <laughs> my children except visiting the imprisoned. And who knows, you know. Amazing. How many children do you have? I have nine. Nine. Nine altogether. Praise yeah. be to God. Five boys and four girls. That's beautiful. What a blessing. They are a blessing. Yes. Uh, we always hoped we'd get into double digits, you know, <laughs> ten. But uh, we did conceive three children that uh, were, were, were called home uh, early yeah. on in pregnancy. So uh, we will meet them one day on the yes. other side. Amen. That's right. Yeah, in, that, in that great family reunion in the sky. That's right. Mm -hmm. Isn't that wonderful? Well, we have, uh, my wife is uh, expecting, as we see, uh, well, baby 10. So one is in heaven and, uh, and, yes. and, uh, and she's now one in the womb. So yeah, July, late July. So who knows? Congratulations. Some friends. Yes. Thank you. It's a blessing. And I remember, you know, as, as we were in the early years having lots of children, Many people saying, wow, you have so many children and what, you know, what a blessing. God's blessed you. I said, well, we don't deserve one child, let alone all these children. So mm -hmm. it's a, it is a blessing. It is a gift. And um, although, you know, if we focus on you know, the crosses and the, uh, the sufferings, it's so worth it because of now, you know, seeing them grow up, seeing them, you know, that family unit, they're becoming friends and, and best friends and yeah, I, c I couldn't think of life without any one of them. You know, I know, this is amazing. I know. <laughs> the dynamics of large families are wonderful. Yes. Uh, everybody has someone to play with. Yep. Um, the lessons are reinforced. Yes. By the, on the younger children, by the older children. Um, love doesn't divide, it multiplies. That's right. Yeah. Beautiful. Geometrically, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, of course, the first commandment, the very first commandment given our first parents has never been rescinded. Be fruitful That's and right. multiply. It's still, it's still. God doesn't change his mind. And I believe that at the beginning of time, when God created the heavens and the earth, he prepositioned on planet earth the resources that we would need mm. as our numbers grew. Resources that our early ancestors didn't recognize, of course, but resources that we have used our creative intelligence, another gift from God, to unlock over time. Wow. So that as our numbers have grown, so that there are now over seven billion of us on the planet, our numbers have grown, our um, resources have grown even faster, so that now we're living longer, uh, healthier lives than ever before in human history. So, well, well, I'd love we, we are coming to the end here and, and we're running out of time. I'd love to spend this last five minutes just about your work. I mean, I, I was fascinated by this, the coming demographic winter mm -hmm. uh, and the claim is and, and through your research and understanding this very point, there are there is enough. We do have enough resources on planet Earth. Absolutely. To feed everyone. Absolutely. Um, and would there be would you say how? How many more people can we have on Earth? And will we have enough resources if the Earth's population doubled or tripled? Could we, w what's going well, on? Well, there are two ways to answer that question. The first way is to say, well, the Earth's population is not going to double or triple ever again because birth rates are falling, right? The world's yeah. population is going to peak at around nine plus billion uh, around 2050, hmm. depending on the um, 
childbearing decisions of your children and my children. Yes. And then after that, the population of the world will decline. So we're not looking at 20 or 30 billion people on the planet. We're looking at nine plus billion. Uh, and we will have no trouble feeding that number. Right now, with current agricultural technology, you could feed 14 billion people on the planet. Now, we won't be able to do that if we deliberately deprive ourselves of energy, mm -hmm. which the population controllers seem to be determined to do. I mean, look, the population controllers very seriously say the population of the planet has to be reduced from its current number down to one billion or so. That's a very dangerous proposal. What would they do with the other six billion of us? Are they planning on embarking on a, a global one-child policy? Are they planning on uh, sterilizing us with some kind of vaccine? <laughs> uh, all of those things have been proposed by the population controllers in their desire to reduce human numbers. Um, and I think ultimately those proposals are more about control than about anything else. Um, they resent um, human freedom in a sense. They've misused their own gift, their own God-given gift of free will and want to deny us the ability to uh, exercise ours as well. I think there's a lot of self-loathing on the part of the population control movement. They don't like themselves very much. For the most part, they often reject children and, and, and even marriage themselves. And they want the rest of us to follow that road down to what some of them call voluntary human extinction. There are people in the world, voluntary human extinction movement, zero population growth, another organization, negative population growth, yet another. Mm -hmm. uh, the Sierra Club, who would like to dramatically reduce our numbers and even extinguish humanity. The most radical of the radical environmentalists, in fact, believe that their idea of paradise is the Garden of Eden mm -hmm. before the creation of Adam and Eve. Because you see, when Adam and Eve came on the scene, we, we human beings spoiled it for the rest of the plants and animals, supposedly. So it turns oh. creation on its head. Yes. Instead of man being viewed as the pinnacle of creation, which he is, and of being viewed as a good steward of the, the, the wonderful earth that we've been given, mm -hmm. God's green earth, uh, we're viewed as a kind of interloper. And Instead of God, the planet is worshipped, or instead of yes. man uh, being the pinnacle of creation, um, they worship animals. It's modern paganism. It, it, is, yeah. it is paganism with a vengeance. It is the mm. kind of, it is a reversion to the ancient animism that used to be practiced by uh, primitive human tribes uh, where they're worshiping rocks and trees. Um, and of course, if you worship a rock, you're probably worshiping some kind of demon inhabiting the rock, uh, in my view. If you imagine um, the world is filled with spirits, uh, many of the spirits that you're trying to invoke aren't ones that you really want to have uh, mm -hmm. any communication with. So it is a reversion to paganism, to ancient animism. Uh, it's a rejection at all levels of, of God and God's gift. God's gifts on, in the world, which include, of course, the ability to use our creative intelligence to improve our lives and improve the lives of those around us. And the best contribution that, that, that you can make, of course, to the future of humanity is by providing the future generation. With hum humans. <laughs> by, providing, by providing children, yes, yes, yes. And of course, the child that you cooperate with God uh, with your spouse and bringing into existence will not only enjoy this life in this world uh, with you and others, it will enjoy eternity uh, with you in the next once they make the right choice. Praise God. Absolutely. So 
Wow. One, I mean, one, one human soul is worth the entire material universe. Amen. Because the universe will one day pass away. Yes. And the soul will go on to be with God forever. Absolutely. Very well said. Yeah. If your work now um, with the Population Research Institute, is there a website we can point people to to know more about what you're doing? It's very simple okay. and easy to remember. Pop.org. Wow. P-O-P dot O-R-G. We got it back in the early, early 90s. <laughs> we were very lucky to get it. POP is short for Population Research Institute. Okay. Of course, I'm a POP and you're a POP yes. with a large family, <laughs> but this POP is short for Population. So we've got lots of information on the topics we've talked about today and, and many others as well. You have a dozen books that you've written. Is that, are they all, are there links to those books there, through that there, website? There or? are links to those books on the website. Yep. There are links to many videos we've done. Excellent. Video on the pandemic that came from China. Yes. Uh, books and articles on the church in China, on China in general, the threat from China, and on the population question uh, as well. So, so, so lots, of, lots of good stuff there. And especially for people who have children or grandchildren, in, in uh, public schools, uh, there are videos about how people have improved uh, the planet and improved the lives of others around them. Uh, really debunking the myth of overpopulation because this is a myth that is being force fed to yes. our children in the schools. And it predisposes them to reject marriage and family and children. Yes. Uh, which is a great, a great sadness as many of them realize too late in life to do anything about it. Wish we had another hour just to talk about that. I mean, <laughs> we, so if we can point people to that website, pop.org, you have lots of research, lots of facts, yes, a lot of absolutely. information people, because I think that's gonna be crucial for us to, to mm -hmm. look at, because as you say, it is forced down our throats. We're seeing, we're being told to, yes. that, you know, we're, we're killing the planet and we're not gonna be here in the next nine or whatever the number is. Right. It keeps moving every 10 years. so. I'm not sure when the end of the world's going to be according to population It's control. always tomorrow, yeah. It's always. <laughs> so we shouldn't be here by now. It's 2023. It was predicted yeah. back in 2012 and 2001. Greta Thunberg, Greta Thunberg yeah. the famous Swedish uh, teenage activist, said in 2018 that the world was going to end in 2023. Here we are. She just deleted that tweet. Yeah. <laughs> it's 2023. Wow. wow. <laughs> and the world is still turning. So. so just a, a, I'm, I'm amazed. thank you for sharing that. And I hope it gives hope to the, many of those people who questioning whether a God exists, those many people who are looking for meaning in life. Uh, we've, we've really scratched the surface today. So I encourage everyone to go to pop.org. Uh, dot, dot a final thought, um, uh, just something to take home for our viewers and listeners uh, watching around the world uh, and, and something you could encourage them today. Well, um, I am very, very fortunate uh, to have found my way to Rome Sweet Home mm -hmm. because the meaning and purpose of life, the relationship to God, the relationship to other human beings, the relationship between the state and man and God is all clear to me now. Um, Christianity, Catholicism uh, has all the answers to the really big questions, including the question of our eternal destiny. And we all need to answer that question now. There's no time like the present. Beautiful. <laughs> thank you very so, much. Thank you. Talk to Stephen Mosher. Thank you for joining thank me today. You. Wow. I hope you've enjoyed that uh, podcast as much as I did Please go to uh, pop.org website, get to know more about uh, the great research uh, that Stephen and his team are uh, providing. And, uh, and please pray for this work. It's an important work. Our world desperately needs to know the truth. And I think uh, with, with so much mixed messages out there, especially in the media, we want to make sure we're getting some solid uh, information. So go to that website and I encourage you to, um, yeah, to do that and share it around. Thanks for joining us. It's another Perusia podcast. I'm Shabal Raish, and until next time, God bless.